Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Jen Gonzalez. I met a guy in August of 2014 through OkCupid. Okay he was 11 years older and lived four hours away, but he was kind of cute. And we started bantering over text and email and then had a phone call. I sort of enjoyed the call, but it felt like he was trying too hard and eventually our direct contact faded. But we had become Facebook friends. Over the next year, I could see that we had similar progressive political ideas. He liked my views on sexuality, and he would comment on my posts in a thoughtful manner, not just in a silly way like some men do. And a little context here. As a sociologist and, sex and sexologist, I post a lot about sex, gender, mindfulness, and healthy communication. Last fall, he private messaged me on Facebook about some sex research and we started texting again. And this, I was enjoying. <laughs> Apparently in the past year, he had watched a lot of my videos about sex and relationships on my In the Den with Dr. Jen series on YouTube. And he really liked them in my educational style. He asked if we could do a Skype call. I said yes. This call went really well. And so we had another and another. Being able to look at each other to see facial expressions gave us a totally different level of connection than on the phone. And then the next Skype call, we both did over a glass, or three, of wine. We were having both intellectual conversations and vulnerable emotional conversations. And then sexual conversations about past experiences, including what we enjoyed. Now, this type of frank conversation is not uncommon for me at this point, but nonetheless, the wine definitely helped out in this aspect. <laughs> Since we wanted to meet in person, he booked a hotel in San Diego for the weekend and drove down that Friday afternoon. We both agreed that a hotel was a better idea than staying with me, so there was no pressure or expectations or awkwardness. He showed up at my door around 4 p.m. and We had immediate chemistry. And the conversation flowed easily. We headed out for dinner and a couple drinks at a fantastic restaurant overlooking the San Diego skyline at sunset. It was, easy, it was an easy several hours with meaningful conversation, cuddling, kissing. And you know, I don't mean to be cheesy, but it was really romantic. It was getting all uh, a little fluttery inside. <laughs> and he liked me a lot. He said that he didn't want to scare me, but I was the woman that he had been looking for and was so grateful that he was getting a second chance at dating me. We also talked about sex and sexual expectations. He doesn't like condoms and hasn't used them in years. This was a problem for me because I'm not on the pill and I'm a sexual health educator and I don't want to get pregnant and I don't want to get exposed to an STD or STI. And I don't like to jump into sexual intercourse right away because the intimacy of sex matters to me. It is a special thing to me. So I wanna know somebody a little better. So, no sex this weekend, he stated. Nope, no intercourse. <laughs> cool, I asked. Not a problem, he confirmed. I wasn't expecting anything anyway. Cool, I said. It was still early, so we went back to my place to hang out. He started kissing again, or kissing and groping, led us into my bedroom. We were taking each other's clothes off. Our Skype wine conversation meant that he had ideas about how I like to be touched in terms of what's unique about my pleasure. He was doing very well. <laughs> At one point, we were side by side facing each other. We were naked, his fingers were touching me all around my genitals, and I saw he was holding his penis near the entrance to my vagina. Huh, this action could be meaningless, or it could mean that he was headed towards my vagina. I didn't want to assume the worst or offend him, but I also wanted to make sure he was still clear on what we had talked about earlier. So I checked in. Uh, what you doing down there? <laughs> Nothing. He laughed a bit. Don't worry, you're fine. All right, I just had to make sure you're not doing anything you shouldn't be. We continued fooling around. We were moving around in different positions, just having fun. At some point, he was lying on his back and lifted me on top of him, so I was kneeling just below his crotch. His left hand was on my hip while his right hand was inside me. 
I was leaning over kissing him. I was upright playing with his nipples. It was very playful. But then I realized that he had a hand on each side of my hips. Yet I also felt him inside me. I pushed off his penis and moved to the other side of the bed. What the fuck? What the fuck were you doing? I asked. I'm sorry, it just slipped, he said. Was it not clear that sex was not an option? I asked. No, it was clear, he said. Then what the fuck was that? I don't know, it just happened. No, no, I don't think it just happened, I said. And as I'm saying that, I'm frantically replaying what happened and how that happened and what was going on. And it was so fucking cliche because at that same time that I was so clear that what he had done was wrong and I had clearly communicated, my head was still spinning because I was taught as a woman to be nice and to give someone the benefit of the doubt. He quickly got up and was putting his clothes back on. I asked him what he was doing. I'm leaving, he said. Oh, no, you don't. You're going to stay here and you're going to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> and I need to say here that I wasn't scared, which mattered a lot. I was angry, confused, disappointed, hurt, and disillusioned because it was going so well. But I wasn't scared. If I felt threatened physically or sexually by him in that moment, I would not have told him to stay, but gratefully, I wasn't. And what I needed in that moment was discussion and clarity, and feeling like I had a voice. So we talked for a while, hashing out what happened, trying to understand why. At one point, I had a sudden intuitive realization that I shared with him that he probably has a long history of doing this to women. Because, and how did I know this? Because gender power dynamics and sexuality are my specialty area because he so easily did this without apparent consideration of consequences. He was a progressive man who cared about the empowerment of women, and he really wanted to date me. But pushing that sexual boundary and expecting to get away with it came so easily to him. He was visibly concerned by me saying he'd done this before, but he said he didn't think it was true. Despite all of this, I could see that what this guy did was an asshole thing to do, but it didn't have to mean he was an asshole. It's bad behavior versus a character flaw. And that I could be both compassionate to myself and my needs in the moment, and still be compassionate, or at least not cruel, to the human being in front of me, as we talked about this until he left. But I was shaken. Even with all the conversation, I still felt disempowered and it was hard to fall asleep. And I was flooded with memories. This wasn't the first time I'd experienced a man being coercive or pushing boundaries. Howard, a college boyfriend, said that if I wasn't gonna have intercourse, I was obligated to give him head, and sulked when I didn't. Abraham in San Francisco just stopped talking to me when I only wanted our hookup to go so far. There's this, what I'll call, orgasm imperative. A social norm that once a man is turned on, it's the responsibility of the person he's with to get him off. But well, there's nothing comparable for women. This grouping of guys, and there were others in my 20s, were pushy and then withdrawn or mean. And they didn't want to have a conversation with me about it. But then there was Brad on vacation in San Antonio and Chad at home after the dance party. It didn't matter what I said up front or how I communicated my hard stops along the way. The assumption seemed to be that once a sexual interaction started, we were on a train, the sex train, which apparently is an express train with no stops, regardless of me asking for stops that went all the way. I'd move them away. I'd say, no, don't do that. Oh, I'm not interested. Please don't do that. And they kept coming back. They kept pushing. Did they think I was afraid of appearing too slutty and said no up front but didn't really mean it? And if so, that is ridiculously presumptuous to think that they could read my mind. Eventually, I'd have to physically move away and get on my buck-naked, 2 a.m. self-righteous soapbox of what the hell are you doing? Much to their surprise. And I think shame. Because some of these guys were really good guys. Kind, loving, sweet men. And they identified as kind, good men. They were taught to treat women with respect. They were visibly shocked that I was saying that their behavior was pushy and inappropriate. 
they didn't know any other way. But when you look at masculinity socialization, literally how boys are told they need to act or not act to be a man, and there's a lot of training around this, this makes more sense. Men are taught from a young age that being a man means not showing weakness, but being strong, confident, and going for what they want, and not giving up. And if they don't live up to that standard, they will be ridiculed, stigmatized, shamed. It's really that simple of a box, a restrictive box that boys and men are put in. And in sex, this plays out as men being the initiators and aggressors. And I know, some of you guys may be thinking, yes, but what about that time I didn't initiate or push? And it turns out the woman didn't think I was interested in her. You're right. Sex is an incredibly complicated, nuanced, and personal topic. This is why we sometimes need to be talking more and doing less even when it's so vulnerable and awkward. Otherwise, it's obvious how sexual miscommunication is the norm. Because we're using different languages. There's a lot of research finding that women and men perceive the same interaction very differently and have no idea the other is perceiving it that way. For example, men don't seem to know that it's not unusual for a woman to dress sexy because she wants to feel beautiful, get attention, be liked, feel valued. But that doesn't necessarily mean she wants intercourse. I think my 30s were pretty good, but my 40s have seen a bit of a resurgence of this pushing. How have they not learned yet? Pushing, pushing, pushing. But policing boundaries is not arousing. It doesn't feel good and constantly puts me in the role of saying no. This is not sexy. I woke up that morning and wasn't sure what to do. I didn't want to see him again, but it felt unfinished. So I texted him that I was playing beach volleyball for several hours, but could meet at a cafe in the afternoon. He texted back a long message. He said he didn't sleep much because he kept rehashing what happened over and over. He said, I was right. His penis hadn't just slipped. I want to share with you part of his text back to me. The why and how I disregarded you is more than troubling for me. Often I've said, it's much easier to beg forgiveness than ask for permission. This I've applied often in my professional life. Now I question the fact that I fought for most everything in my life, that that mantra has bled into my personal life as well. You may have been right about past actions and the other's willingness to capitulate instead of protest. Again, this is troubling to me. To think I've become a boorish brute sickens me almost as much as the fact that has ruined our relationship in that regard. Since getting to know you, Jen, you have gotten me to look at myself in a manner I'm slightly unaccustomed to, yet find myself still welcoming it without question. You have praised my insightfulness. It has come about mostly because of you. You have come to mean more to me than I care to admit. As for meeting up later today, I'm up for that, only if you want to and not feel obligated and uncomfortable to do so. I share this text with you because him reflecting deeply on this and owning it mattered a lot to me. He wasn't blaming me or shaming me. I still wasn't going to be his friend anymore and wasn't going to date him, but his responsible handling of his actions after the fact meant that I wasn't further disempowered. I had a voice. He was listening, now at least, and I didn't feel so powerless. And he seemed to be waking up to the negative impact of his how to be a man training. He would have faced shame growing up if he wasn't man enough, but now he faced shame because he hadn't learned how to question how that training could hurt others. That's the shittiness behind how we're all trained to be men or women. As I continued to reflect on the night before, I became increasingly frustrated with a different kind of powerlessness. I'm an empowered, outspoken woman. I'm lucky to have that level of confidence, yet this continues to happen. I'm a strong communicator. I work to own my shit, clearly communicate my thoughts and emotions, and speak about expectations. I teach individuals and couples how to do this in my intimacy counseling work, and I work hard to practice what I preach, yet I still had this experience. The limits of my control, even when I'm using my words properly and responsibly, is frustrating. This feels powerless. And it feels sad, just 
sad. We only have our words. How do I fix this? Don't trust men. Don't get naked. Don't be alone with them. Don't hook up. Have them sign a contract. <laughs> have a buzzer that goes off every 20 seconds, and we pause and check in. <laughs> These answers suck. <laughs> but I don't have a good one. Because the problem is, I can't fix this alone. It takes two to communicate. We met at 3 p.m. for about an hour. Just small talk initially about San Diego, books we were reading. He could tell I was distant. And then I addressed this topic head on. He reiterated what he wrote in his texts. But I needed to know that he wouldn't do this again. I needed to know what he was going to do differently in the future to make sure he stopped this lifelong pattern of sexually coercing women. He said he was going to ask for permission. He was going to check in along the way. He wasn't going to assume the woman wanted the same thing he did. He was going to be cautious before he moved into intercourse and make sure he heard a yes. Is he really going to do these things? I can't know for sure. But I do think he's going to try. He was horrified, like most good men would be, of realizing he'd been sexually violating women who just went along with it. I do think he's been changed positively by this experience, despite the shame. When I shared this story with a male friend recently, he candidly responded, what did you expect? You were naked, it was passionate, and intercourse is just the next tick in the sexual progression of how things go. Well, not really. First off, intercourse has a very different level of potential consequences and responsibility than other sexual acts. Potential physical, emotional, social, financial consequences. And what did I expect? I definitely can answer that question. I expected caring. You're drawn to me because you appreciate my intellect, communication skills, vulnerability, and authenticity. I respect you and honor you as another human in front of me, and honor that we're engaging in some form of intimacy with each other. I expect the same respect and honoring in return. Is that too much to ask? Is that kindness and caring and awareness somehow not relevant in the sexual realm? It should be most relevant there. Do many women want and like sex? Yes, me included. But the assumptions around when, how quickly, and with whom are rampant. Nowhere else do we just assume we know what someone else wants to do with their body than in the sexual realm. You don't just shove food in someone's mouth when you're out to dinner with them. <laughs> <laughs> you let them use their voice and have a choice. So check in verbally. If you don't, you're making a ton of assumptions and not being responsible. What's a check-in sound like? For example, a man once actually asked me, are you feeling pressured? It was our first time doing anything sexual, and he had noted a shift in my energy that I seemed more hesitant because he was looking for enthusiastic interactions from me. For example, Hell yeah, mm, yes, oh God, don't stop. <laughs> I felt so honored and respected and safe with his level of awareness and asking. But if that's not what you're hearing from your partner, then question it and talk or just stop because the emotional, physical, and social stakes are too high. Why can't the training on how to be a man include being strong enough to have these uncomfortable conversations. I shared my story with a small group of 25 sorority women at a university recently after giving a big lecture about women and hookup culture. They were so attentive and quiet when listening to my story. Afterwards, the consensus was how surprised they were that I said something in the moment, that I called out his behavior as bad behavior. The ones who shared said that they probably would have just gone along with it. Gone along with it. It's easier to allow a sexual assault to happen than to make things uncomfortable. They didn't know how to speak up for themselves in that way. We've been trained to be nice. So speaking up or halting an intimate situation feels so uncomfortable and inappropriate with a high potential for rejection or shame, they will avoid it. But it is clear that this is not working for us. And I believe that these types of sexual interactions happen all the time. 
I didn't really want to publicly share this story. And I really didn't want to have it videotaped to be online, mostly because I didn't want my mom to see it and worry about me. But those young women are the reason I'm telling this story. I'm not speaking for all women, but I know I'm speaking for enough women. And I'm speaking to enough men. And I think it's important to say, I've had sexual interactions with a lot of great men, some who are here tonight. <laughs> Respectful men, communicative men. When I spoke my boundaries, they didn't push. If they wanted to try something new or I did, we checked in with each other. Men who pay attention and listen. And I want to honor these men for somehow having the courage or gratefully having received the training to overcome the masculinity script you've been taught growing up and learning to listen to and really honor the women in front of you, including me. We need to start creating these new stories about sexual communication and interactions. So let's start that now. Thank you. Thank you.